Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos, um bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa, estamos aqui mais uma vez ao vivo do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como espaço para conversas ao vivo entre os maiores expertos do mundo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios. E o tema de hoje é como capturar valor com Open Banking. Eu vou passar para o inglês para apresentar aqui nossos convidados. Today we are hosting Alessio Botta, partner at McKinsey in Milan. Alessio has been leading several open banking, instant payment, strategy and transformations across Europe. Good morning, Alessio. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have also here Gustavo Tayar, partner at McKinsey in São Paulo. Currently, he leads McKinsey work on payments. Good morning, Gustavo. Bom dia. Good morning, Denise. Bom dia a todos. Obrigado. And Natasha Litvinov, senior expert at McKinsey in São Paulo, also specialized on payments and working on PICS and open banking. Good morning, Natasha. Hi, Denise. Bom dia a todos. Bom dia. Vale lembrar que vocês poderão fazer perguntas a qualquer momento, clicando no link ou no botão acima da janela do vídeo. Por favor, contribuam. A participação de vocês é fundamental. Today's session will be in English. Gustavo, let's get started. Although today's session will be in English, I'll start in Portuguese and then we can switch. Okay. Antes da gente começar essa conversa com o Alessio, que vai nos contar um pouco do que ele tem visto na Europa e como o Open Banking está impactando a indústria lá, e depois a Natasha vai nos ajudar com a discussão de como isso está evoluindo no Brasil, eu queria fazer uma breve introdução sobre o que é Open Banking. Né? Então, Open Banking é uma nova regulação que exige que os bancos deem acesso a informações sobre seus produtos e também informações de seus clientes, obviamente com o consentimento desses, a outras instituições financeiras e também instituições não financeiras, as outras, a outras empresas. E, e com isso, aumenta-se a transparência no setor e possibilita a entrada de novos players, um aumento da competição entre os players que já estão participando desse desse mercado, né? O que faz o que faz com que isso fique melhor, principalmente para os clientes finais. Essa nova tecnologia ela é toda baseada em, em, em APIs, uma nova plataforma tecnológica que permite modernização e permite o acesso a essas informações. Então, como vocês veem nessa nessa página, né? O que antes era um cliente que interagia com uma instituição financeira que era a única que tinha todas as suas informações, passa a ser esse cliente interagindo com essa instituição, mas outras instituições também tendo acesso a essas informações desse cliente, podendo servi-lo de outras formas. Então, acho que isso isso é, de uma forma bem bem simples, Open Bank. E o que a gente acredita é que Open Bank vai, de fato, transformar essa indústria, vai mudar a dinâmica de forças, uma vez que traz informação, traz maior transparência. E aí, nessa mudança, o que nós veremos são alguns vencedores ou empresas que vão se beneficiar disso, né, como por exemplo, a gente tem alguns exemplos aqui nessa página, os, os gigantes tecnológicos que vão ter acesso a novas informações de seus clientes que eles ainda não tinham e vão poder consolidar isso com informações que eles já têm para oferecer outros produtos e serviços para esses clientes e aqueles que vão ser impactados negativamente, alguns que hoje têm monopólio dessas informações ou que por algum motivo serão impactados negativamente. Obviamente que não tem uma resposta certa de quem vai ganhar e quem vai perder. Isso vai depender muito da dinâmica do mercado né, e de como os diferentes players vão reagir, mas o fato é que isso vai acontecer. E aqui a ideia é discutir um pouco de como isso vai acontecer, entendendo um pouco de como isso já aconteceu ou vem acontecendo na Europa e a nossa expectativa de como isso evolua no Brasil. Com você, Denise. Obrigada. Natasha, can you tell us how is the Open Banking theme evolving in Brazil? Yes, yes, sure, Denise. So when we look at what's happening in Brazil, uh, the movement that we've seen happening in Europe since 2015 is happening in Brazil now in 2020 and 2021. Uh, in the end, uh, the central bank is pushing the regulation together with the instant payment regulation here that it speaks. Uh, there are several steps that will happen in 2020, now in November and then 2021. And I think that one of the milestones that we need to keep an eye on is what we'll see in May when the banks will have to uh, give access to the, the information about their clients' records and also the products that they have. In the end, this is something that will happen across the next two years and, and that will change the industry from then on. Okay? Important to mention that even, even before May, right, and, and before this formal deadline that the, the central bank has imposed right, and is pushing really hard to, to make it happen, we already seen 
some fintechs and other companies exploring these, these new regulation, right? Having access to this information, uh, thinking on how to apply this information on the day to day, on credit analysis, on income statements, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is already a reality in Brazil. Okay, Alessio, Europe has been through this process for some time now. What has happened? Thanks, Denise. Uh, so what happened in Europe uh, was uh, quite surprising at the beginning. Uh, while uh, the regulators thought about PSD2, which is the regulation uh, in uh, the European Union for open banking, as something to stimulate the market uh, and uh, to provide uh, more uh, sophisticated and digital services to the end users, consumers and enterprises, uh, the European banks initially reacted mostly with uh, a regulatory, purely regulatory approach. So the project of uh, complying uh, to PSD2 was uh, mostly managed, let me say, as a very technical project uh, without uh, a business impact. This uh, gave uh, uh, to uh, attackers, fintechs, uh, digital banks, and the like, uh, the opportunity to react quicker to the market, to, to, to this market disruption, and to do two things. First, uh, being the first movers on what we call the basic and user use cases. I think that uh, many people that are attending uh, uh, this event are probably starting to think about uh, like uh, account aggregation or personal financial management. But at the same time, we saw the rise of a new market where many fintechs, payments specialists, and industry utilities are uh, offering to banks uh, the, uh, through API platforms that enable the banks uh, to interact between them and with other fintechs. The result of this is that uh, the consensus in banking executives around Europe is that this was uh, a bit of a lost opportunity in the very first years for the banking market, and that, uh, uh, let me say, from a recent survey that we've done, two thirds of European banks uh, are still struggling uh, with monetizing their strategy around uh, APIs. I think I think Alessio brings an important point here which is the speed of answer of the companies, right? And what we've seen in Europe is banks being resistant and, and waiting to see on, what, on, on how this was going to evolve. And the result, as Alessia mentioned, is these new fintechs and other players that enter and then start disrupting the market. And now we are seeing the large banks and the incumbents reacting to that. So I think this is, this is an important point, right? How, how fast you need to answer to this new trend. Okay, then I'll ask you, what kind of opportunities does open banking create? What are the, playing, the players, I'm sorry, trying to do? Sure. So open banking is a very, very broad field. So let's try uh, to, uh, to, to, to structure it a bit. If we look at the open banking value chain, uh, we see four uh, types of uh, moves. The first move is API development. It's not something probably uh, that is uh, banking related. This is where this is banks uh, spending uh, money, so capex, uh, to develop the APIs. So it's more of a business for core banking system providers, system integrators, large uh, uh, payment specialists. Then there is the business of uh, selling somehow the APIs uh, from producers. So this is the very first business for banks uh, that can uh, use APIs as new products uh, for other financial institutions or for corporates. Corporates can consume APIs directly, and this could be considered as a service. You see here that the revenue pool is quite small for a reason. Many APIs that will be produced by banks uh, are uh, regulatory APIs, so they must be done by banks and typically are available for free. But of course, there is the opportunity of going beyond the regulation and monetizing also. The third opportunity is about API platforms. So here, as I said, this is something that we've seen in Europe. We will have also maybe some more details later, where uh, payment specialists, uh, uh, fintechs, uh, core banking system providers, they have created these platforms that are like gateways or one-stop solutions for banks and fintechs to access uh, APIs from uh, other players in the ecosystem. And this is a, a, a quite interesting uh, market that is being created from nothing, basically. And then, of course, there is where the opportunity lies for uh, 
uh, the, the traditional players in banking, but also the challengers, is in packing uh, APIs or leveraging uh, the API infrastructure to deliver new end user applications to all types of segments from individuals, private banking, uh, small businesses, uh, corporate, all type of clients can benefit from end user applications that are well thought around the API platform. And Alessio, maybe maybe you want to explore a little bit on, on the on the revenue pool that we are seeing in these in these different uh, buckets because I can see that the difference is, is huge in end user applications. So how do you expect this to grow? So we, uh, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, is a is a very good point, uh, Gustavo. Thanks. So uh, as I was saying, uh, I think that uh, the API producer is uh, is a must do because uh, banks uh, will need to comply to the regulation and can leverage this as an opportunity. But it's not where the big uh, the big uh, uh, value will come from. The API platform is an interesting revenue pool, but is more for specialists. And we've seen also banking systems around Europe joining together forces at the domestic level to create industries utilities that could take this opportunity. And user application is where not only, let me say, the pool is, uh, is bigger and most interesting, but is also where we expect the biggest growth because here really sky is the limit as more APIs are available in the, in the, in the market. Uh, beyond banking, uh, opportunity arise. Uh, the, the, the type of uh, applications that can be built uh, is, uh, is exponentially growing. So, I mean, here is really where we see the real value and the real growth for the next years. I mean, Alessio, can you share some concrete examples with us, please? Definitely, Denise. Here you see some examples related to API production. So the second element and the first interesting for banking players and financial services in, uh, in the value trade that we've seen before. So what we've seen in other geographies is basically this is a bit of an evolutionary journey, right? So uh, banks typically start from exposing regulatory APIs, which are very straightforward, mandatory, Typically, they, it's, uh, the very good thing is that there is a standard, uh, but it's very difficult to monetize. In most countries, uh, this is uh, for free. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a market standard. The second level is uh, once banks have established their API infrastructure for the uh, regulatory requirements, then they can start to develop additional APIs in the banking space. And here you have different types of APIs. You have banks that are using APIs to, uh, let me say, deliver, especially to corporates, uh, products that are already on their shelf. So for instance, FX and trade finance, uh, e-commerce, uh, or, or let me say, uh, enrich the regulatory APIs. But there are also banks that are using these to provide completely new services or functionalities to their clients. So, for instance, in Europe, many banks are now offering account number validation, which is an API of a service that does not exist, at least in the European market, in a traditional form. And is very helpful, for instance, for utilities and large billers, because they can use this API in their internal workflow to optimize, for instance, the billing process uh, with a significant impact on cost saving for the corporate. The problem here is that uh, despite being, let me say, a monetization opportunity, there are no standards typically because this is the beyond regulation. So we are seeing some banking communities in Europe collaborating to develop standards on this specific step of the evolutionary journey. And then there is the third step, which is going beyond, beyond banking, which does does not mean that banks should develop on their own in-house beyond banking services, but that they can partner with non-banking players and expose APIs from third parties on their own platform or integrate external services on their platforms with this. It's a bit of the ecosystem move that we will discuss also later. 
if we move to the next type of play, and so we we'll comment very quickly here, but this is quite interesting because uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, a very uh, recurring theme that we've seen uh, in Europe and we've seen it also in the US. You might have heard about the visa plan deal, um, which is again in the news these days. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, players taking advantage of open banking to create these large platforms that are basically gateways where all the banks and the financial service provider can expose the API and can also use this gateway to access to everybody else in the system. And of course, once the gateway is in place, there are a number of additional opportunities like uh, adding uh, non-banking APIs uh, to the to the to the gateway to the platform, or even packaging, uh, white labeling uh, some use cases for the banking uh, for, for the banks participating in the platform, so that banks can accelerate the development of the use cases and share investment on these platforms. And the third element is, of course, as we were saying, the end user uh, applications. These are examples for individuals. And you see, I mean, here I think that uh, there are at least uh, three levels of use cases. One level is the very basic one. You don't see them here, but typically is account aggregation. So the possibility for an, uh, for an individual to have all of their account uh, from different banks in a single app. The second element is uh, defining uh, use cases which are a bit more sophisticated, but still quite simple. Here you see uh, a bit of them. Uh, the one I like the most is the subscription manager. So you have in your banking app uh, all the subscriptions from uh, different uh, pay-per-use uh, providers, uh, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, Amazon Prime, or even different types of uh, subscriptions. And then this is collected from your different bank accounts, credit card accounts, and the like, and you can use the app to subscribe and not subscribe on a click from the different services. But you see also other, that is, for instance, the opportunity to use open banking for personal credit scoring and advices on how to improve this. There are players in the U.S., like Credit Karma, that have built significant pieces of business based on this model. Uh, and for instance, for the small medium enterprises, CapBank is also another ex uh, another uh, uh, name that has been recently acquired uh, by American Express. So the use cases, uh, I mean, uh, in, in this area are, uh, let me say, very interesting. And then there is beyond banking. So how do you package use cases partnering with third parties that are not part of uh, of uh, um, of uh, the banking ecosystem? For instance, many European banks are thinking about how to bring their services through APIs on the customer journeys for e-commerce. So for instance, selling real-time insurance, travel insurance, also, I mean, maybe this is not the best period of our life to, 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 to mention this case, but selling real-time real insurance, selling real-time insurance uh, while buying uh, uh, a travel on an in, uh, on a on an uh, e-commerce platform. Really, really interesting cases, Alessio, and and I think just to reinforce, right? These are things that we are seeing in Europe, and we start to see here in Brazil. So, on one of the examples that uh, that Alessio gave us is on on credit scoring or using those informations in order to access the credit score of the clients, and we are start seeing companies doing this or to estimate the income or even to validate identity. So, so I think this is something that is emerging really quickly uh, and and getting to Brazil faster than we would imagine before. But what are the trends uh, driving the open banking opportunities? I would say there are, there are four main trends driving that, right? One is the expansion of awareness and the use cases, right? So uh, something that was driven by regulation, right, and, and led by the adoption of fintechs and, and some uh, new players is now being disseminated in the market, right? So this is the first step to growing open banking. The second trend is that the financial institutions are increasingly willing to offer access and integration to third parts, right? So they are seeing this as a possibility uh, to offer their products through new channels, but also to offer new products uh, to their clients. So I think differently from what happened in Europe that Alessia mentioned that it took some time for that, 
we expect that in Brazil this is going to be faster as, as the, the players are seeing that it's important to move fast here in order to gain an advantage. The third one is, is the emergence of the API aggregators, right, who are which are companies that are focusing on aggregating all the information, on building these APIs, on aggregating this information in order to provide this data either to fintechs or to big techs. This is a new player that we didn't have in the market before and that is emerging in the market as, as this is evolving. And finally, I think most important, the positive perception of the end users. So the end users, the customers are starting to see and, and willing to share their information as they see benefits, right? And are willing to uh, consume financial products from non-financial institutions, right? Something that was trust-based and that you have a reason to trust in your financial institutions, they are now open to consume those products from other institutions that are not the typical ones that we are used to. So I would say that those are the four main trends, Denise. But how have users reacted? What can we expect from clients? Okay, so as, as I mentioned, right, I think the reactions are changing, right? So here we have a survey that we did in UK to try to understand the willingness of those users in sharing their information, right? And so, so I think that there are two important points to mention here. One is, of course, it changed according to the profile of the user. So here what we did is we mapped different personas and we tried to understand their willingness to share their information, not explaining really well on the benefits on, on the why, right? And we see that they are not that willing and there are, there are a, few, a few groups that are even less willing to, ch to share. All that said, once you explain and you make clear the benefits related to sharing this information, what we can see, and this is the difference from the blue numbers to the white ones, is that this willingness increases a lot, right? So one example is the tax save that we have on the left side of the page, who say 21% was willing to share information before they understand on why and the benefits, and that moves to 30, 37, right? So this is, this is, I think, the main message here, right? Consumers are willing to, to share the information once they, are under, they understand that they will be benefited from, by that. Okay, cool. And Natasha, how can companies uh, <coughs> position themselves in this context? Yeah, so I think that one of the important things here is to start to think how you are going to play this game uh, in open banking, right? So. If we start from the very traditional play that we are used to see in the market, we have uh, companies producing their products and distributing them using their own channels, right? And this is what we are used to and what we've seen and how we've been playing this game uh, over the last years. But then with open banking, we have two movements that are possible. If we think of products, you can use your own channels not only to distribute your products, but to distribute products from other parties, right? And this is when you move in the, in the slide from, from to the left, to the right, I'm sorry, right? So you become an aggregator or a solution provider and you use your own channel here to pick and, and show and distribute and offer other products that other people are, 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 are creating, right? And we've seen many fintechs and many banks in Europe like N26 or TOS in, in Korea doing plays like that and putting together products that are being created and, and produced by, by other companies. The second move that you can do is uh, instead of only thinking about your own channel, thinking about third-party channels and how you're going to leverage them to distribute your, your products. And this can uh, take the, the, the figure of, of uh, a bank distributing um, investments through third-party platforms, but it also can take the figure of, of someone using, offering uh, service as a software or bank as a software, as a service, I'm sorry, for, for other companies to build their services there, right? And then in the middle of that, what we see is that we have or ecosystem orchestrators that are playing all around and having a, a wider offering there. So the idea is uh, considering the opportunities here, understand what is the play that we want to do and how we position ourselves here will be important. Do you want to do some comment or can you go ahead? Uh, as, as, as I said, I, th I think how to position will depend a lot on, on the different companies, right? And you need to think on how you leverage your strengths and what you want to do in order to choose on where to play. As Natasha said, there are many possibilities on how to play uh, with in, in this new field. So thinking, thinking about it and, and reflecting and, and building a plan is, is key here. Okay, good. Thank you. Alessio, how are the players monetizing this? 
I think we have an example here of uh, of a business case. So uh, the, the, the revenue, as we've seen before, there are different things that can be done, right? So here we're looking at uh, a business case for uh, a universal bank. So let me say this is for uh, maybe the, 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 the traditional financial service providers that can enter into open bank. And basically the, the, the value streams are to expanding to third party channels so trying to cross sell the products from uh, the, the own products elsewhere or to use third party channels to acquire new clients and the second is integrating third parties so uh, build on the existing traffic on own digital channels to cross sell services from someone else typically beyond banking so that uh, there could be some uh, revenue sharing uh, uh, agreement. If you look at the composition, uh, typically a large part of the value comes from the white element, which in the agenda is described as prospects. So basically many banks in Europe are looking at open banking as a way to acquire new clients. So honestly, this is going to increase uh, significantly the uh, competition. But also there is a dotted item that you see, which is a potential upside on current clients, coming from the fact that open banking, as we discussed before, gives the opportunity to develop completely new services and completely new journeys that are out of scope of the current banking revenue pools. I spoke before about a very simple example an API for large billers to uh, check uh, account numbers before uh, issuing a bill. So that is something new that is not existing at the moment in the banking revenue pool. So it will be in the dotted side and could be considered as an upside. I think what is interesting is also the sheer size of the, of the business cases. Of course, this will depend a lot on the bank. But if you take, let me say, the, the, the leading banks in the European market, uh, many of them uh, are going for uh, business cases that are over 1 million uh, uh, euro uh, revenues uh, recurring. So I mean, something that uh, is probably one of the most strategic initiatives for the bank uh, around that investment, uh, which is uh, between 40, 50 million euros uh, over three, four years. So also, I mean, a, a quite important uh, investment also in terms of capex. Uh, one element of uh, uh, reducing this investment is uh, uh, collaborating with others and investing uh, in industry utilities uh, where non-differentiating items uh, can be put together by different banks. Okay, and I'll ask you, uh, what is, what's the risk of doing nothing or not reacting? It's a good question. I think uh, the risk of doing nothing is the flip side or the negative of this business case. So if we believe that open banking would be mostly a driver for client acquisition and cross-selling, the risk is actually of losing clients or at least losing market share or not capturing the market share on the new services. So the dotted element here in the past. I think there is a second system, uh, a second risk, which is, let me say, more in the long term, which is uh, not the risk of not being, uh, um, not being uh, uh, a leading player or a relevant player in the future beyond banking ecosystem plays that, that Natasha was also describing, or which is something that uh, many uh, top executives in the banking uh, uh, market think would be the future of banking. And uh, I think that uh, in the shorter term, if we look at the Europe in particular, there is a risk of uh, losing a bit the momentum, not uh, having the first mover advantage, uh, and losing uh, track uh, against uh, uh, digital players that can move very, very fast uh, in the first months or the first couple of years of uh, uh, open banking uh, uh, market opening. And Natasha, what does it take to succeed? Yes. So. I and before jumping to that, I wanted to comment on something oh, that Alessio sure. said. Mm -hmm. I think that when we look at the Brazilian market and the way that it's been behaving over the last uh, years and the number of new players that we've seen there, uh, I think that the objective that the central bank has here 
of increasing competition is happening and the ones that are going to be able to move faster are probably going to capture uh, most of this opportunity and use it to grow. So I think that we have a competitive landscape that is quite interesting right now and that the, the, this can be used as an opportunity to really capture additional path, uh, additional uh, size and market share in the, in the Brazilian market, right? And then when we think about how to succeed in this environment, I think that with open banking, the rules of the game change. So we've talked a lot about all the value that is on uh, the new applications and new services that need to be developed. And this is around owning, owning the customer, right? And controlling the relationship that you have with him to be able to monetize on the traffic that you have on your digital assets or monetize on all the information that you have on that client. The other thing is that this is a customer experience game. So we are talking about solutions to end users and this needs to be very simple and very convenient. And this is uh, something that can be a game changer on how adoption is, is, is going and how many people are going to use the services that you're going to provide. The two other elements are more related to technology. One of them is that this uh, is built on uh, and it's built on an API platform and this technology must be built and created within many companies and once you create it you need to expand it and maintain it. And the other one is that you need data capabilities to be able to extract the maximum value on the, all the information that is circulating in your systems. Uh, the two final elements are around, first of all, having a business strategy. So it's not doing it just because everyone else is doing it, it's doing it with a clear view on how you are going to extract value from it uh, and where your business case comes from. And the last one is that uh, in order to reduce investments but also to be able to offer things that are creative and add value, you need to think about what are your partnership capabilities and who are you going to connect with to create these new services uh, that are valuable to uh, and, and things that are valuable to the end customer, right? Interesting. And Gustavo, how to approach this problem within organizations? So, Denise, I think there are four main questions, right? And Natasha already mentioned one of them. Is first of all, defining what is your aspiration level, right? Setting a clear objective that the organization can align around, right? It can be a defensive strategy, it can be a more aggressive strategy, but the important is to have a clear strategy for the organization to get organized around it, right? So this is the first key question that I see. The second one is understanding what are the opportunities that you wanna go after, given the strategy that you have defined, it, right? So there are, as Alessio give some examples, and Natasha mentioned there are many, many opportunities brought by open banking, right? And, and for sure, an organization cannot go after all these opportunities. So defining which are the opportunities that you are going after, given the strategy that you have defined, it, is, is key as well. The third part, right, is building the right capabilities in order to push those, those initiatives or those opportunities, right? So defining your operating model, right, the technological capabilities, the API platform that you are gonna build, how you're gonna interface with your customers and so on. So this is the third element. And I think the fourth is planning your go-to-market, right? So plan and structure the way you are gonna reach your aspiration, how you're gonna take that to your clients, understand how your competitors are gonna react, so planning on, on how to execute it, right? And, and I'm gonna finish with, I think these, these are the four questions, but I think there's an important element that is the speed that, that you need to do it in order, in order to be competitive. So now I'm gonna address some of the questions sent by our audience, and the first one is for you. Uh, to Gustavo, do you see most of the opportunities of open banking on individuals or companies? I think that I think there are there are opportunities for both sides, right? And I would say especially individuals and also small and medium companies in Brazil, right? I think I think one of the challenges that that main banks has on serving these small companies is getting to know more about those companies. And so, similarly to what we are going to see for individuals. We are going to see uh, financial institutions with more information in order to better serve those companies, uh, also for individuals. So I, I would say it in easy that that is for both, right? But within companies, I, I, I would say more on the small and medium segment than in the large ones that are more consolidated. But that said, opportunities everywhere. Mm -hmm. I understand, Natasha. How PIGs impact the the discussion of open banking? 
So it's a discussion that goes together, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's an agenda. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, in many countries, instant payments is seen as, as, an, opportunity, as, an, as an initiative within open banking. Here, the central bank is looking at the two things separate. But in the end, the objective is the same. It's about increasing competition in the banking sector and creating new opportunities for new players and new services to, to arise there. So uh, when we look at what the central bank is doing here in Brazil, they are pushing this agenda to Together, and both things are closely linked, right? Particularly when you think about new services that can be created that are beyond just simply providing information, but also executing transactions, right? Being able to initiate payments from third parties and things like that are things that are going to be uh, integrated with the open banking strategy as well. Okay. And Annette, uh, I'll ask you the next one is for you. Is open banking an encouraging factor for big techs to move further into banking? This is the thesis uh, beyond, let me say, many open banking uh, war games. But actually, we have not seen this yet, uh, at least at scale. Uh, I think that there are some signals. I think, for instance, that uh, if you bring uh, open banking to the extreme, uh, moves like Apple Card in the US, where uh, Goldman Sachs is providing uh, the, 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 the back end uh, and uh, Apple is providing uh, the front end, the different channel, is something that uh, could be seen uh, uh, as an entry in the, open banking, in the open banking market. But honestly, so far, we have not seen uh, anything, let me say, at scale or particularly decided. I think that an interesting market to look at, uh, especially these days, also, uh, where this is in the news is uh, China, where actually Chinese big techs uh, are heavily leveraging uh, APIs and open banking for their ecosystem moves. So uh, we can expect something like that sooner or later to happen, but at the moment there are only little signals. Okay. Natasha, who are the different players that are taking advantage of this open banking opportunity? So I think that we see, yeah, we, we see three, three main groups here that are moving around and trying to position themselves. And, and we talked about them uh, in different moments here in our conversation. So the first one is uh, the traditional banks. And what we see traditional banks doing is that they are focusing on functionalities that they can push through other channels or functionalities that they can provide as an additional services in their channels. But then we have a second group that is the fintechs and the neobanks. Those are the guys that have taken advantage of all these to try to create new services and new, new, new platforms that aggregate things and just have a consistent offering. So they are going away from their monoliner approach that is in general how they started and start to build new things uh, and to consolidate and complement their offering. And then the final one are the big techs, right? So we expect them here to, as Alessio mentioned, we expect them here to, to position themselves and try, start to aggregate uh, all these financial services to their platforms and monetize on the huge traffic and number of users that they have. So those, this is a third group that, that we expect there to move. Mm -hmm. Gustavo, uh, how to become a successful ecosystem player? So this, this is a really good question. It's and a million then, dollar question. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the one that everyone is asking, right? But, but I think Natasha mentioned, right? I think uh, providing what your customers want Right, with a great experience is, 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 is the way, right? So all ecosystem is all about having the client at the center and being able to serve the needs of those clients, right? And I see open banking as a way for companies to better understand their clients, what they want, and have information on them so they can provide everything that this client needs. So I think putting the client at the center is, is key to become a successful ecosystem, but I don't think that's the only answer right on the only piece that you need to put together. Then it's not that simple to answer this one. If I can jump in, I think that companies that are doing an interesting job there are the ones that are linking uh, different, uh, different places or different uh, parts of the value chain, right? So ecosystems that are able to link the physical world with the digital world, 
uh, and offer solutions that work on brick and mortar retail shops with uh, the digital site or uh, maybe a marketplace where you're offering your products or payment solutions that connect online are, are things that are really interesting and that probably are, are one of the secrets where you can explore how to succeed with an ecosystem play. Yeah, orchestrating to, 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 to serve all the needs of those new clients, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's yeah. the key for it. From the beginning, yeah. To the end, yeah. Alessio, the next one's for you. Since this is already going on in Europe, what are the main lessons learned? So, if I had to suggest uh, three things to someone starting the, this journey in other geographies, I will mention the, some things that I have also already somehow mentioned uh, in, in, in my speech before. But the first is move fast. Move fast, don't wait. This is uh, happening, uh, has happened elsewhere. It's not something that can be stopped. Uh, we'll introduce new market dynamics. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's important to have uh, a strategic view on this disruption. It's going to happen. It's not just like, let's see what's happening. It's happening. The second is, uh, uh, this is not, uh, and, and this was a mistake from, by, as I said, by many European banks. This is not a compliance or pure technology thing. This is something which is strategic, CEO level, and a group-wide priority. And I'm speaking particularly for traditional financial service providers. This is something that will require the cooperation from all business units, all central functions. So it's really something highly strategic that requires a group-wide effort. And the third element is, uh, I think this is a good opportunity for many banking systems to get back to cooperation and creating industry utilities uh, where banks uh, can share investments in open banking, at least for the non-differentiating items, like the rails, let me say, or the pipes, uh, and then uh, build in-house or with third parties their own differentiating uh, uh, value proposition. And I would, these are the three things yeah. that I would suggest. And I would say this, this last one is, is really important for the Brazilian market, right? Where all the banks and the financial institutions are really looking hard for efficiencies, right? So mm -hmm. leveraging this last point that, that Alessio mentioned, I think it's, it's key in, in our market. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gustavo, Natasha, Alessio. Grazie mille, Alessio. You <laughs> in Italy, beautiful Italy. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Thank, Thank you for you having very us much, here. Denise. Obrigada a todo Grazie mundo. A voi. Ai, que linda essa língua, meu Deus. <laughs> Queria agradecer também a você de casa, a todo mundo que mandou as perguntas e quem passou os últimos 45 minutos com a gente. A próxima sessão vai ser a abertura do McKinsey Operation Series. Vai ser o dia 6 de novembro, às 8 e meia da manhã, nesse horário que você já está acostumado, vai acontecer todas as sextas-feiras. E o nome da sessão de abertura é Entenda o seu cliente, como o Machine Learning pode multiplicar a precisão da projeção de vendas. O painel vai ser com Fábio Medeiros, que é Head Supply Chain da Natura Com para a América Latina e Hispânica. E vai ter também a participação do Luiz Flávio Araújo, que é sócio da McKinsey, em São Paulo. Para você conhecer a nossa agenda completa, vá a mckinseytalks.com, lá tem a nossa agenda, tem também os outros, é, os outros episódios que a gente já fez aqui, na segunda-feira o episódio de hoje vai estar disponível e os episódios também estão disponíveis em Spotify, no Spotify para quem gosta de podcast. Então, mais uma vez obrigada, bom fim de semana e até a próxima, tchau.